Uh, my topic is greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Stop blaming the bursa. Well, my my disclosures are available on the academy website. But another way of looking at this is that really this is a tale of two scenarios. Most commonly, tenderness over the greater trochanter really isn't very hard to recognize, and it's also a seemingly easy target to inject. So it's common that you'll see folks who have had at least one or sometimes even multiple laterally based injections by their primary caregivers who may not necessarily be very well indoctrinated as to the nuances of these hip disorders. And when you get reports of these injections, you're kind of scratching your head on exactly uh, what were the structures that were injected. Now at the other end of the spectrum, maybe say, hey, let's just go get an MRI and it shows an abductor tendon tear. Well, imaging evidence of abductor tendon pathology is often the normal consequence of the aging process, but also compensatory laterally based hip pain often accompanies hip joint pathology, which may or may not show imaging evidence of abductor tendon damage. To me, trochanteric bursitis is comparable to the pre-arthroscopy era biceps tendonitis uh, diagnosis for anterior shoulder pain. Now, most of the people in the audience aren't familiar with the pre-arthroscopy era shoulder anything. But back before the arthroscope, all anterior shoulder pain, oh, you got biceps tendonitis. But with the arthroscope, we realized that isolated biceps tendonitis is uncommon. Typically, those are slap tears, undersurface rotator cuff tears, subscap, almost anything, but not biceps tendonitis. Well, a lot of that trochanteric bursitis really isn't bursitis at all. Uh, and, and that's what sort of led to the term greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which although less specific is more accurate for the constellation of things that can present as laterally based hip pain. Abductor tendinopathy is a common cause of recalcitrant laterally based hip pain that fails to respond to conservative treatment. Looking specifically at abductor lesions, I used to run the other way from this because I felt like they're old people, they're miserable and they're hard to sort out. But over time, I figured out that only two of these three things were true. It wasn't more elderly population. They were severely disabled, but not necessarily that hard to sort out. Two things that are true are that MRI evidence of abductor tendinopathy is an incidental age-related change oftentimes, and symptomatic abductor lesions often masquerade as recalcitrant trochanteric bursitis. The relevant clinical findings, really with your history and your physical examination, that's how you establish the relevance. Uh, keeping in mind, as we said, that MRIs are really too good at showing problems in the abductor region, and your history and exam helps to establish the meaning of your imaging findings. Ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections, maybe saying it's a deal seal is a little strong, but you can see these lesions under ultrasound quite well. You can, under direct visualization, inject the lesion. If they get relief, that reinforces that, yes, that lesion is clinically relevant. This is the very first abductor tear I ever did. A 68-year-old gal sent to me by her orthopedic surgeon that I had operated on. She was miserable, disabled with this abductor tendon damage. I would try to send these off to somebody else, but her surgeon said, listen, you'll operate on me. Why won't you operate on my patient? So embarrassed me into operating on her. Um, and I remember she was very unhappy and I just finally said, lady, if you just won't fuss at me for trying, I'll give it a shot. And this was my very first abductor repair, big sleeve avulsion of the gluteus medius, the whole thing's pulled off. You kind of look at it sideways, it looks just like the rotator cuff in the shoulder. We use a double row technique with three transversely oriented double loaded anchors, pass in a mattress fashion, incorporate these with the knotless distal anchor. Uh, and this is the, the first one we ever did. And then sort of begrudgingly over time, I would do a few more because they actually turned out to do pretty well. And we looked at our earliest experience with minimum two-year follow-up and we found four things. One, these patients, when we compared them to our published data on FAI, these patients were more than 20 years older than our FAI patients. In this series, they were all females and the vast majority are females. The preoperative modified uh, Harris hip score baseline scores were more than 20 points worse than our FAI patients, but the amount of improvement was double that what we saw with FAI 
And that dispels two commonly held myths about hip arthroscopy. Number one, that older patients aren't candidates for arthroscopy. A lot of these patients, the average age is 56, but many of them are in their 60s and 70s, and occasionally in their 80s and active people that are disabled by their symptoms. And the other one is that preoperative low baseline scores indicate poor outcomes from hip arthroscopy. And that's simply not true because these patients are severely disabled but can have excellent results from surgical intervention. So in conclusion, laterally based hip pain oftentimes exists in conjunction with intraarticular pathology. It may simply be pain referred from the hip joint or they may have compensatory laterally based problems. The imaging evidence of abductor tendon damage is oftentimes an asymptomatic finding. Uh, abductor tendinopathy is a common source of recalcitrant laterally based hip pain, which led to the greater trochanteric pain syndrome diagnosis. And your history and exam are important for the clinical relevance aided by ultrasound. And lastly, there are various options for symptomatic abductor tears. Re endoscopic repair has a high success rate but there's a growing number of non-surgical and surgical options that don't require formal repair, especially for the partial thickness tears. The results of, open, of, of taking down the partial tear and repairing it are excellent, but it's the onerous rehab process. It takes six months to recover from it. So anything we can do short of having to do a formal repair on the partial tears, uh, that's a, a huge area that we're working on. Thank you very much.